All righty. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our very first evening at the homestead of the season. I hope everyone uh, got onto our Zoom presentation smoothly. If anybody has any difficulties throughout our presentation, you're, you're welcome to type them into the chat and we'll try to help you out on how to work things. A um, couple of housekeeping notes and uh, ways of introduction. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jenny Evans. I manage our Native Landscapes and Garden Center and also am our Adult Education Director. So welcome to our presentation. Um, this presentation is being recorded, uh, just so you're aware. Um, and for those of you that are new to us, as a quick intro to SCCF and who we are, um, we're the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation. We were founded in 1967, and we are dedicated to the conservation of coastal habitats and aquatic resources on Sanibel Captiva and in the surrounding watershed. And the way that we do that is through a number of our program areas. Uh, we have a wildlife and habitat management department that takes care of our almost 1,800 acres um, in the surrounding area. Uh, we have a native landscapes and garden center that I work in. And uh, if you need any native plants, you're welcome to come see us at the Bailey Homestead on Sanibel. We also um, have programs at the Sanibel Sea School and environmental ed uh, on our local beaches with kids. Uh, we have a research marine laboratory that operates out of the Tarpon Bay area. And then tonight, uh, we're going to be focusing on our coastal wildlife department. Um, and I'll be introducing Kelly Sloan in just a, just a couple of minutes. Um, a couple things to know about tonight's presentation. We will be taking questions. Um, if you can put your questions into the Q&A box, if you're working on a desktop or a laptop computer, you should be able to look towards the bottom of your screen where it says Q&A. And if you click on that button, there will be a place to type in questions for us. You are also welcome to type questions into the chat, though I have to warn you, we may not see them as frequently as if you put them in the Q&A box. Um, otherwise, um, like I said, if anyone needs anything throughout the presentation, please type it into the chat. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it over to Kelly Sloan. Uh, Kelly is the director of our coastal wildlife program and also the director of our sea turtle program. So Kelly, take it away. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight to learn about sea turtles. I know we're all really eager to hear about leatherbacks from our experts tonight. Uh, but first, I'm just going to give a little, really brief update on the 2020 nesting season here on Sanibel and Captiva. All right, so it was a season full of records all around, starting with our first crawl of the season, which was on April 1st, and it was a leatherback false crawl. And it was the earliest crawl we've ever seen on our beaches among all the different species that nest here. And the record was previously held by a Kemp's Ridley nest on April 16th of 2018. And you can see that turtle in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Um, Kemp's Ridley's actually nest during the day, which makes it really easy to take photographs of them. We also had our earliest nesting on record for loggerheads with the first crawl on April 14th of this year, and it was a loggerhead false crawl on Captiva. And our earliest loggerhead nest was on the east end of Sanibel on April 15th. And the previous record for the earliest loggerhead crawl was a nest on Captiva on April 20th of 2012. And keep in mind, we don't even start our morning surveys till April 15th, so, and that's considered early. So these were really, really early nests this year. Um, it started off really early and really strong. And we also had record numbers of nests on our beaches. So we had 660 total loggerhead nests laid on Sanibel, and the previous record was 650 and 266 loggerhead nests laid on Captiva, and the previous record there, I believe, was 196. So we really shattered that record this year. And then, of course, the total for both beaches was also a record at 926. So nest counts are a good way to gauge the population size and recovery, but it's also important to consider the total number of hatchlings emerging from those nests um, when you're evaluating the overall success of the season. So this year we had about 33,737 hatchlings emerge from nests on our beaches, which is down about 15,000 from last year. 
Um, we just had a really low hatch rate on both of our beaches this year for a variety of reasons, but you can see that the overall trend is going up. So we're in good shape in that way too. So we also continued our nighttime research project this year and we were on the beach every night from May through July, starting at sunset and going till sunrise, looking for nesting females. And we saw more turtles on the beach than we ever have before. So that was another record that we set this year. It was really cool. And I'll just share a couple of the highlights from the turtles that we saw a lot this year. This is a turtle named Sifoma. She was originally tagged in 2016, which is when we were uh, naming turtles after shells. And she's one of the largest turtles that we saw this year at 3.6 feet long. Uh, that's just the shell length that doesn't include the head and the tail. And I don't know if Chris and Kelly are gonna talk about this, but that's nothing compared to the leatherback, you'll find out. And we saw her 13 times this year and only two of those were nesting events and 11 of them were false crawls. And what's interesting about her is that she was very slow and lethargic. She would crawl about 10 or 15 feet up the beach and then take a really, really long break and then keep going. So sometimes it would take her over an hour just to false crawl. And then there's Pisa. We saw her nine times this year and only one of them was a nesting event. So we probably missed her nesting quite a few times and eight were false crawls. And she was actually missing her left rear flipper and a piece of her shell from an old healed wound. Um, so she had a really interesting and distinct track on the beach. And it just goes to show, you know, she was still successfully nesting. These are really remarkably resilient animals. And then there was pistachio. We saw her nesting four times and false crawling three times. And she actually laid two of her nests only 15 feet apart. Um, so she had really, really strong site fidelity. This was on West Gulf Drive, I think around Beach Access 7. And we had a chance to put three satellite tags on loggerheads this year for the first time ever on Sanibel. And their names were Periwinkle, Genonia, and Pepper. And Pepper, after she nested, um, actually went down through the Keys and into the Bahamas and settled off the coast of Cuba. So we think her foraging grounds are down there. And Periwinkle beelined it down to the Keys after she was finished nesting. So those are her foraging grounds. And Genonia actually stopped transmitting um, before she made her post-season migration. So unfortunately, we won't find out where she goes for, for the foraging um, time. So now I'll switch gears to leatherback nesting. This was by far the highlight of our season. Uh, we had seven leatherback nests total. Four of them were on Sanibel, two were on Captiva and one was on Cayo Costa. And we don't monitor that beach. Dr. Phil Allman from FGCU uh, monitors up there with his students. And we saw this turtle four times. We named her uh, Juniper. And we confirmed one of them as Juniper through satellite telemetry. That was the one on Cayo Costa. But we do believe that all seven nests were laid by Juniper just based on the timing. So the average clutch size for all those nests was 90 eggs. Only one of them on our beaches hatched. It was nest three on Captiva. And that nest incubated for 63 days and produced 56 hatchlings. And two of them were still alive in the nest at the time of inventory. And those are the cute pictures you can see on the left there taken by Carrie Salatino. And there was also a nest on Cayo Costa that hatched and produced 45 hatchlings. So it was really neat to have some leatherback hatchlings emerging from the beaches of Southwest Florida this year. So early in this season, when we saw that this turtle was coming back over and over again, we were connected with Kelly and Chris from Florida Leatherbacks uh, because we wanted to try and get a satellite tag on her. Uh, a leatherback has never been tracked off the coast of uh, the Gulf Coast of Florida before. So it was a really unique opportunity for us. And a lot of logistics go into making this happen. And these two are just really experts when it comes to working with leatherbacks. And we were really lucky to have them leading the charge on this. So I'll turn it over to them in just a second, but first I wanna tell you a little bit about their backgrounds. Um, Kelly Martin has worked with sea turtles for nearly 20 years now. She grew up in Michigan and obtained her bachelor's degree in zoology from Michigan State University. She began her career working with nesting leatherbacks, assisting in sea turtle rehab and conducting nesting surveys along the east coast of Florida. From there, she moved to Clearwater Marine Aquarium and then ultimately Moat Marine Lab, where she worked in the aquarium assisting in nesting research and completed her master's degree in marine science at the University of South Florida 
studying the auditory abilities of loggerhead sea turtles. She returned to the east coast of Florida as a biologist for Loggerhead Marine Life Center, where she helped manage nesting surveys on one of the densest nesting beaches in the world and managed leatherback tagging and tracking project. She later moved to the government sector and spent four years conducting lighting surveys and managing sea turtle compliance monitoring for beach renourishment projects in Palm Beach County. She currently works as the program coordinator for Marine Environmental Education Center and serves as the president of Florida Leatherbacks Incorporated a nonprofit conducting leatherback tagging and tracking on the densest leatherback beach in Florida. Her passion lies with leatherbacks and she has seen just over 1000 in her career, but she's interested in all aspects of conservation of all seven species of sea turtle. And Chris Johnson has been conducting marine turtle research since the early 1990s along Florida's beaches. Chris has worked with the city of Boca Raton Florida Atlantic University, Nova University, and Loggerhead Marine Life Center. While working at Loggerhead Marine Life Center, Chris was responsible for conducting surveys along the heavily nested beaches from Martin County, from the Martin County line to John D. MacArthur Beach State Park. Chris, along with his partners at Duke University, Palm Beach County, Sea Turtle Con Con Conservation League of Singer Island, and John D. MacArthur Beach State Park, began a comprehensive study of leatherback turtles in 2001. That study identified more than 600 nesting leatherbacks utilizing north, northern Palm Beach County beaches. In 2014, Chris and Kelly formed the nonprofit Florida Leatherbacks Incorporated to study the endangered leatherback sea turtle population in Martin County, Florida. So clearly we have a very experienced team here to talk with us tonight. And with that, I'll let you guys take it away. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I'm gonna interrupt really quickly before we let uh, Kelly and Chris get going because we had a few questions that I think may help inform um, some of what they talk about. And um, any of you feel free to speak up. Um, one of the questions uh, related is what is a false crawl and why do turtles false crawl? I can answer that. So uh, when a sea turtle comes up on the beach, she either false crawls, which means she doesn't lay her eggs or she ends up nesting. And false crawls are, are not uncommon at all. They can, they can false crawl for a number of reasons. Um, you, you know, anywhere from human presence, bright lights, um, they just don't like something about the sand, maybe it's too dry, all kinds of environmental reasons too. So it's not unusual to see them false crawl at all. In fact, on our beaches, we have a false crawl rate that's um, more false crawls than nests. And then one more, one more question, um, is climate change causing early nesting? You guys want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> if it makes more sense, if it's informed after your talk, uh, Kelly and Chris, we can, we can hold it to the end. Um, you know, what? I didn't really address that in our presentation, so I'll go ahead and take a stab at it. Um, I think it's a little too early to really determine the effects of climate change on timing of nests. Um, what we have seen and whether or not it's related to climate change fully determined, but we have seen a shift north. Um, in a lot of nesting, the Carolinas are getting a lot more nests than they used to, even nests as far north as Delaware and even um, New York. So we are seeing kind of a shift, even in the peak of where like our leatherbacks usually nest in the middle of the state, that's starting to shift a little bit north too. So yes, the answer is very likely, but we don't have any of those definitive answers just yet. All righty, thank you. And with that, um, I think we'll hold the rest of the questions until the end. And if you guys want to get going, uh, go for it. All right. Thanks for letting us talk tonight. Uh, thanks, Kelly and uh, Jenny. Um, my name is Chris Johnson. I'm the vice president of Florida Leatherback City. As Kelly said, I've been doing leatherback work for a number of years. I'm my partner and president of Florida Leatherback City, Kelly Martin. And Kelly's going to speak to us tonight. One second. I'm going to share screen here for you. All right, so hopefully everybody can see that. I'm just going to back all the way through this since we were practicing a little bit beforehand. <laughs> so I'm going to try and keep this light for everybody. Um, we have a lot of fun pictures in here. Hopefully that's kind of maximized on your screen so you can see everything um, that we're going to tell you about today. We're going to try and keep it fun, give you some exciting information about leatherbacks in particular, and then about the research that we've been doing. I tried to save a lot of our fun stories, too, just to give you at the end of this. Um, we will have plenty of time for questions and answers. So as Jenny mentioned, throw anything in the Q&A at the bottom, and we'll do our best to tackle whatever we can. 
So leatherbacks are the largest turtle on earth. Um, they are actually upwards of seven feet in length and the largest leatherback on record was just over 2000 pounds. They are the only living member of their family and they've been around for over hundred million years. And they do have the widest distribution of any reptile on the planet. They can be found in temperate to tropical waters in the Indian Atlantic and Pacific oceans. And as I mentioned, they're the only living member of their family, um, and they have a lot of very unique adaptations that make them somewhat um, different than the hard shell turtles like loggerheads and green turtles that we often hear about. They actually lack a bony shell. Um, the reason for that is flexibility. Instead, they have a rubbery, oily connective tissue um, over loosely, they're called bones or um, ossicles. And what that allows them to do is dive to great depths. Um, because that's not a rigid shell, it's more flexible, it can contract under pressure. They also have a pink spot on the top of their head. Um, a lot of people see this and think it's an injury. It's actually kind of considered a window to the pineal gland. And what that does is it allows them to see changes in day length or light, um, light and dark. And what that is, is a kind of a migratory cue. So that change in day length helps serves as a migratory cue for them. They also have really unique adaptations for tolerating cold temperatures. Um, our leatherbacks often head up to as far north as Canada in the, in the summer to forage. They have what's called countercurrent heat exchangers, which is just a fancy word for how their vessels are arranged to avoid heat loss. They also have a thick layer of fat and also a network of blood vessels that allows blood to flow to the skin to prevent them from overheating. They also have a unique method of salt removal and actually all sea turtles have this, but leatherbacks is quite large. They have a gland that sits right behind their eye. Obviously all sea turtles are taking in some seawater with the food that they're consuming and they don't wanna take in all that salt. So the gland behind their eye actually processes the salt out of their body and it gets excreted as uh, what you can see in the picture on the right hand side, what looks like tears. So if you've ever seen a sea turtle nesting on the beach, a lot of people think they're actually crying. That's just a really concentrated salt solution. They also have a modified esophagus, and I'm gonna show you a picture here in just a second, but it might be in your nightmares later. <laughs> this is the inside of a leatherback's mouth and throat. Those are actually rigid papillae, and it's for a very unique reason, simply because of their diet. Leatherbacks feed almost solely on jellyfish. Obviously, as you can imagine, these are very, very slimy animals. So those papillae help ensure that the food is going down in the right direction. So leatherbacks are the deepest diving of all marine turtles and actually can outdo a lot of marine mammals as well. Uh, the maximum dive depth recorded is over 4,000 feet. They actually surface quite often, typically every four to 10 minutes, but they can stay under for over an hour. And they spend as much as 30 to 40% of their time at the water surface. So this is just kind of a, a broad idea of where many of the nesting beaches are in the Atlantic, that northern coast of South America, um, Guyana, French Guyana, and Suriname are the major nesting beaches, but a very large nesting be beach was recently discovered over in Africa, in Gabon. Um, Florida is really not considered a major, major nesting beach. It's one of the smaller ones. So here in South Florida, their nesting season is March through June, which is a little bit earlier than loggerheads and green turtles. They lay fewer eggs, only about 60 to 80 eggs. And as with all reptiles, their sex is determined by temperature. Um, those eggs usually hatch out within 60 to 70 days. And if we're lucky, what we're left with is something like this. So like I said, I just wanted to include some cute little videos in there. This is actually a nest that hatched out first thing um, after sunrise. These are all healthy leatherbacks. They are about a little bit smaller than the palm of your hand, but quite a bit larger than some of the other hatchling species. And personally, I think they're the cutest. <laughs> um, so with all species of sea turtle up until recently, after they left the beach, um, after they hatched, we didn't know a whole lot about what was going on with them. We called them the lost years. There's quite a bit of research going on now about what happens with loggerheads and green turtles. We still don't really know much about leatherbacks and where they're going after they leave. So leatherbacks are considered endangered. Some of the primary threats include direct tape, take or poaching. A lot of the beaches that they nest on further south don't have quite the protection that we do here in Florida. So direct take of eggs and meat is a big problem. 
Boating and shipping is actually a, a major problem. As I mentioned, they spend 30 to 40% of their time at the surface, leaving them prone to boat strikes. And my apologies ahead of time, not ahead of time, my apologies for that photo. It's a little graphic. Uh, that was actually an individual that we had tagged as part of our research, who unfortunately was fatally struck by a boat. Habitat loss is obviously something we're all kind of fighting right now as sea levels begin to rise. Um, there was a recent study released by Nature Climate Change that reported that the world is going to lose half of its beaches by the year 2100. Um, obviously, with increased storm activity and things like that, we're losing critical beach for these turtles to nest on. And then with leatherbacks, the primary threat to them is actually fishing interactions, particularly trawl netting and longlines. Um, 60,000 plus leatherbacks a year are killed in commercial longline fisheries, which is the picture at the bottom right. Um, and then another issue is with trawl nets. Um, so shrimp trawls collect between five and 20 pounds of bycatch for every one pound of shrimp that's caught. Um, so the picture on the bottom left, that's a trawl net. Those are drug along the bottom or through the water column. The intended catch is usually shrimp or fish or things like that. But obviously with a big net like that, it's not very selective. Um, so anything that's in its path is going to get caught and discarded as what we call bycatch. So that's a major threat for turtles who need to reach the surface to breathe. Um, if they get caught in those nets, unfortunately, they will drown. So because of a lot of those threats, the Pacific population of leatherbacks has actually dec declined by more than 80% over the last couple decades. However, thankfully here in Florida, the story is a little bit different. Since monitoring began, um, their nest numbers have begun to increase exponentially. So that's a really good thing. The thing about them was prior to maybe the 1950s, they didn't really nest here. Um, they kind of showed up in the 60s and 70s. And then as you saw on this graph before, their numbers really started to shoot up. But we didn't know anything about them. All we knew was that they're here and that their nest numbers are increasing. But all these questions on the right hand side, you know, how many turtles are out there? How often are they returning to nest? Where do they come from? We really knew very, very little about them. So we set out to figure out how we're going to answer these questions. And in 2000, um, a group of researchers, including Chris, sat down from Duke University, uh, Loggerhead Marine Life Center, the county organization in Palm Beach County, some state parks, National Wildlife Refuge and decided that the best way to answer some of these questions about this mystery population was a long-term hands-on research project. So that got started in 2001. Uh, the initial project was in the very northern part of Palm Beach County. Um, if anybody's familiar with Palm Beach County, that's the Jupiter and Juno Beach area, as well as MacArthur Park and Singer Island. So a team of researchers went out every single night during nesting season, season, and they were covering about 12 miles of beach. And at the time, this was the most densely nested area for leatherbacks. And essentially what they would do is anytime they encountered a nesting female, they would tag her. So she gets some form of identification. And you can see in the photo, these are the types of tags that we would use. It's essentially just a metal tag, the same thing that you might find on cattle. And then they also get a microchip. So it's the same thing that we're putting in our dogs and our cats, it's called a pit tag. Um, that one's a little more permanent, that goes into the muscle, whereas the flipper tags can come out over time. We also took measurements of each individual, um, a skin biopsy for genetic sample, and we documented any injuries that she might have and what they could potentially be from, such as boats or fishing interactions. So we did this, started in 2001, and the first time we kind of compiled all of our data into a summary paper was after 11 years of data collection. And in those 11 years, we saw a total of 466 individual leatherbacks. Uh, this was actually really good news. Prior to this study, state wildlife officials thought that there were maybe less than 100 nesting females in the state of Florida. So for us to have found almost 500 of those in the first decade was fantastic. We also determined their annual survival rate was quite high. Um, it was about 89% from year to year. So that was another good news. Um, we were seeing about an average of 100 turtles per year. As I said, we saw 500 over about a decade, but about 100 per year. And we noted that they were coming back every two to three years. So those tags stay on, and we continue these surveys. So every time we go out on the beach, we're checking those turtles for tags. Um, and then we're just taking note of how often they come back. And we found that they were coming back every two to three years. 
and that each female was laying about two to four clutches or nests per year. So over those 11 years, we started to think about what other techniques we could use um, to learn more about this population. One of those was satellite tracking. Um, if you saw Kelly's picture of Juniper before, you will note that she had just a very small transmitter on her, only about that big. <laughs> Obviously, this picture is from, I think, 2005. You can see technology has changed a lot. Uh, we no longer use this system as it's not necessary. But I'll show you a few more pictures later on. So this is just an example of some of the short-term and long-term tracking data. On the left, we have a turtle that left our nesting beach and made it all the way up to Nova Scotia, uh, Canadian waters, where there's big jellyfish populations for them to forage on. And another turtle that hung out, um, that cluster of points on the bottom and that right-hand map, that's her cruising around in between each of those two to four nests that I mentioned that they lay. Once they're done for the season, they all seem to head north and she made her way up off the eastern coast of the United States. And this is a map, this will take a few minutes to play, uh, but this is just a map of some of the turtles that we've tagged long-term over the years. Like I said, they stay in our waters from usually February through about the end of June. And then after their last nest of the season, they usually head north in search of food. Um, the longest transmitter that we've ever had on was about two years. That turtle left Florida. She went up off the coast of Nova Scotia. Once it got too chilly there, she actually headed down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of South America. And then over the course of the next year, she made that same loop again. So these animals are using the entire Atlantic Ocean. They don't all typically follow the same path. Um, whereas we see that with a lot with our loggerheads and green turtles, these turtles are kind of doing their own thing and picking their own path. So that's just kind of an idea of where some of these turtles are going after they leave the nesting beach. We've also looked at dive behavior before. Like I said, we have uh, the deepest dive on record is over 4,000 feet. We use various types of transmitters to look at that um, and kind of get an idea of how they're using the water column and whether or not they're visiting the ocean floor. And I mentioned genetics too. Obviously don't pay too much attention to the details in the graph on the right. But essentially what it is, is it's a family tree. So we're able to kind of look at the relatedness of the individuals that are nesting here in Florida and also compare it to other populations to try and figure out why they showed up here, um, what the population origin was, where they used to come, where they used to nest. But what else can we do? You know, with all that information, there was a lot more questions that still remain unanswered. One thing that I touched on was they come back every two to three years but over the course of our study, we've seen turtles that disappeared for 14 years and then showed up to nest again. We didn't know if they were actually taking 14 years between nests or if they were simply nesting somewhere else and we weren't catching them. I also mentioned this is a lot of math, but it basically we were seeing they were nesting every about two to three times per season. However, we've had individuals that nested as many as 11 times. So those turtles that we were only seeing once, twice, three times, were they only nesting that many times? Or were they also, again, nesting somewhere where we just weren't seeing them? If we're estimating that turtles only nest two or three times, that's gonna result in an overestimation of the population, which we don't wanna do with an already endangered population. So we decided that one way to answer a lot of these questions was to expand our research onto what had become now the most densely nested leatherback beach in the state. And that is Martin County. Uh, that's on the east coast of Florida between Palm Beach and um, like the St. Lucie County area. There's a uh, National Wildlife Refuge in there. There's a state park in there, uh, Jupiter Island, which is a residential area. Um, so we really started to see an increase in density of nesting there. We wanted to do this to kind of increase upon the research that we were doing and catch more turtles. So just to give you an idea of where we were, um, that red box, that's Palm Beach County. Sorry, that's Martin County. Our previous survey area was the bottom arrow. And then we expanded to include all of Martin County, which oddly enough only contains 2.7% of the state's coastline, but nearly 40% of the leather rack nesting. So it's a pretty heavily dense, heavy, heavily dense, densely nested area. <laughs> um, Palm Beach County and Martin County total had over almost 70% of the statewide leather rack nests. So we just did a pilot year. It was only about six weeks of the season from May through June. Uh, we just did part of Martin County, just 15 kilometers at the south end of the island and in the state park. 
And it turns out it was very, very successful. Um, just in those six weeks, we had saw 101 unique individuals. We saw them a total of 173 times. So we were seeing them obviously more than once. And what was really exciting was 50 of those 101 turtles were previously tagged. So now we know that the turtles that we were seeing on our previous site are moving all over the state. They're not staying in this one little box where we were serving. So about half of the turtles we saw that year had been previously captured in Palm Beach County. Um, so it was working. Um, this does indicate poor site fidelity. Site fidelity means where they're choosing to nest. Leatherbacks seem to not follow the rules and they wander all over the place to lay their nests, whereas a lot of the other species kind of stick to one certain area. So of those 50 tagged turtles, as I mentioned, 49 were previously tagged by us. And then there was one that was tagged by the University of Central Florida. They operate in the Archie Carr National Wildlife Refuge, which is up in Brevard County. Five of those 50 had actually been observed in both counties previously. So this also speaks to the communication among groups. There's several tagging groups around the state of Florida. Uh, we all work pretty closely together to keep a good database going. So this is just kind of some math. The original study is at the very bottom. That's where all of those turtles were initially tagged. Once we started, the further we, oh, far, farther away we got from that original site, the fewer and fewer tagged turtles we were seeing. So when we moved just north of the county line, 60% of those turtles were already tagged. The further we got north into Martin County, only 30% of the turtles were tagged. So it's working as we move further and further away from that tagging, original tagging site, we're starting to incorporate more turtles into this um, data collection set. So this is just a summary of the last six seasons of working in Martin County. It's been tremendously successful. Um, we got lucky, and as I mentioned when we were answering questions before, we have seen a shift north in where a lot of these turtles are nesting. Uh, whether or not that's related to climate change is too early to tell, but the beach that we're working on in Martin County is now the densest nesting beaches for leatherbacks. And in those six seasons, we've had 1,434 encounters Actually, I think that bumped up a little bit. I didn't include the last couple of weeks. <laughs> um, with 474 individuals, 180 of those, or 38%, were new. So a drop in new turtles from 50% to 38% means the study that we're doing is working. Uh, essentially, what we're trying to do is called saturation tagging, or get some kind of identifier on all of the individuals out there. So it's working. We've also been fortunate to do a lot of satellite tracking. Um, we've done four short-term transmitters. I think we've done about uh, 12 or 13 long-term transmitters now with various organizations. Um, so that's been exciting. And then this year we actually partnered with the Sea Turtle Conservancy to participate in the Tour to Turtles. So five of our leatherbacks participated in that. If you're familiar with it, definitely check that one out. So over the 19 years since we began this study, we have over 870 tagged turtles in our database, which is fantastic. Um, and a total of 4,627 encounters. So I mentioned before, uh, we were looking at short-term tracks. This is just four tracks from four different turtles between their nests. Leatherbacks nest every eight to 11 days. Um, so obviously they're covering a lot of ground in that short time. So once they nest once, they'll usually head straight offshore. They'll head north, usually end up somewhere around the Cape, Cape Canaveral area. And then they'll turn and they'll start making their way back south and nest again in eight to 11 days. And then this is a map of some of our longer term tracks. These are turtles that we tracked two and three years ago. Um, that spinning around that you see at the bottom, that's between each nest. So they're heading north, they're going back south. They head north, <laughs> they go back south. And then in a second, you'll see them zip up and they're done for the season. So these are turtles that are sticking kind of close to the east coast of the US. Um, so as I mentioned, I kind of want to get into some interesting stories and just some unique things that we found while we were out there on the beach. We do have some dual citizens for those of you that are snowbirds. Um, we have both Canadian and Costa Rican turtles nesting on our beach. Uh, back in 2014, we found a turtle with a tag that we didn't recognize. After doing some searching, uh, we found out that that turtle was actually tagged way back in 2001 on a nesting beach in Costa Rica. Uh, it was the first known case of a turtle nesting both in Costa Rica and Florida, so we were pretty excited about that. And I mentioned our Canadian friends. Um, I've mentioned it a few times, but our turtles do head north in the summer after they're done nesting. A lot of them end up off the coast of Nova Scotia to forage on big groups of jellyfish up there. And there is actually a research group um, operating out of Halifax, Nova Scotia, 
And they go out on fishing boats and they actually capture these turtles in water to do the same thing that we're doing. They're putting transmitters on them and they're tagging them. Um, so we've exchanged quite a few turtles with them, which has always been fun. This year, we actually had another turtle with tags that we didn't recognize and we called into the state to find out if they knew who it might be. And it was actually a turtle that was tagged last summer uh, by NOAA. They also have an in-water capture program off the Outer Banks um, and she was just captured the, su the summer previous. This is one of our favorite turtles. She's got such a great story. I know the picture doesn't look like it, but she does. Um, this turtle's name is Venus. She was tagged in 2003. Um, in 2006, when the researchers came across her, she had this massive boat strike, and that's what you're looking at in the picture. Um, it was actually a lot more severe than that picture looks. We could see lungs. Um, with leatherbacks, they just don't do very well in captivity. Um, so there really wasn't a whole lot that we could do for her. We thought that this injury would be fatal. Um, however, in 2008, researcher was out on the beach again. And she found a turtle with tags, and she called into the office to find out who it was. And they said, there's absolutely no way. But it was Venus. Um, that scar from the injury that you see there was almost invisible. Um, she has essentially what's just a thin little line left on her shell now. So their ability to heal is pretty fantastic. It's pretty tremendous. For the first time ever two years ago, we got 11 nests from a single female. That was the most we'd ever seen before. Prior to that, it was uh, a nine. And then Kelly introed it and gave a lot of information about her project that we were so excited to be able to help with this season. Um, as she mentioned, they had a leatherback nesting in the area pretty consistently and wanted to get a satellite transmitter out on her. So there was a lot of collaboration between groups. We even worked with Marine Lab, who was able to provide us with the satellite transmitter. Um, and we headed over to the coast to spend a few nights looking for this turtle. Um, unfortunately, on our first trip there, we were not successful. We spent three nights on the beach and didn't have any luck. And we headed back over to our coast. And about five days later, we got a call from one of the beach crew that said, we've got the turtle on our beach again. Uh, so we knew that she was still in the area. What likely happened was she nested on one of the other beaches while we were there the first time, but it was April and there wasn't consistent monitoring going on outside of their area. So it's possible that she nested elsewhere then. So nine days later, we plan to make a trip back over. Um, we were patrolling all night and it was raining and it was about 3.30 in the morning. Lightning. And there was a lot of lightning and we were getting ready to head in and we were cruising down the beach and there she was nesting on the beach. So thankfully we were able to get the whole crew out there and place a satellite transmitter on her. This is kind of an indication. That's actually her in the bottom right picture. Um, it's a little hard to see, but that tiny blue spot, that's all, that's her transmitter. Um, there's just, the technology has advanced so much and the transmitters have become much smaller. I don't know if you can see us in this, but that's the size of the one that we put on her. So that map on the left is her initial travels between her first couple of nests. And then after the nesting season, so the red line there is her track during the season. We were very excited to see that she actually passed through the Florida Straits and ended up over on our coast. That little icon is actually right off where we live and where our survey area is. Um, it was actually the first time ever that a turtle has been tracked on a nesting beach in the Gulf of Mexico. There have been some other tagging and tracking studies done, but those were in water captures um, in the Gulf. This was the very first time that any leatherback with a transmitter has crossed through the Florida Straits and ended up on the East Coast. So that was a really exciting thing to see. So like I said, this is her animated track. You can give that a look just to see what she was doing there in the Gulf. We aligned it with one of our tag turtles named Jesse. And in a second here, you're gonna see just how much Juniper kind of behaved like one of our turtles over here. So she and Jesse spent a lot of time in the same area, uh, a lot of similar <laughs> behaviors. So that was really interesting to see. Um, like I said, it's the first leatherback tag nesting in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, Kelly get, went through a little bit of these details. Her first crawl was observed there on April 1st. She was observed again by the crew on the 10th and then a satellite tag was attached on the 19th. She was observed again um, on 529 and 67, and there was actually another nest on Cayo Costa that she mentioned on 617. Based on the timing of all of these, we think that she actually laid nine nests. Um, they do, like I said, nest every 10 days or so, and based on the timing of both when we saw her and when we missed her, we think she laid a total of nine nests in the Gulf. So here's another one of our favorite turtles, this is Clover. Clover was also tagged in 2003. 
When she came up to nest again in 2005, our, found, our team found that she was missing one of her rear flippers. So uh, it was because of a shark attack. She was still able to dig her nest though. She had one working flipper, so she was fine. However, in 2007, when she was found, her other flipper was also missing. Um, both of these were from shark attacks. These were natural events. But unfortunately for sea turtles, they use those rear flippers to dig. So without her rear flipper, she's unable to nest successfully. They are unaware of this, so she would still attempt to dig. Um, unfortunately, she would just lay her eggs on the surface and they wouldn't make it. But because we were out at night and we encountered her often, we found we were actually able to dig an egg chamber for her and she would lay her eggs in that successfully. So I have a little video to watch here of what it's like to encounter clover on the beach and assist her with the nesting process. So as we're cruising along, we're looking for that big black shape on the beach and track leading up. This was a nest that was actually in MacArthur Beach State Park. She was on CNN. Yep, Clover actually made CNN at one point. They liked her story so much. <laughs> so you can see normally leatherback rear flippers are two feet long or so, two to three feet long. Hers are just little stumps that are left from her shark attack. So those are not functioning. They don't have enough tissue there to properly dig a hole. Leatherback nest cavities are usually upwards of three feet deep. Right now, she's just trying to get herself down in the sand to find a good spot to nest. You can see on the right side of her shell there, she actually has a shark bite there too. That oval shaped, half oval shaped mark out of her carapace is from a uh, shark as well. So this is Clover attempting to dig. Um, like I said, they don't really have a concept of the missing flippers. So she's going through the normal motions that she would as if her flippers were intact. And this is shot with infrared. Those lights are not actually as bright as they seem. Mm -hmm. That's when our biologist had to put the camera down <laughs> uh, and was able to sneak up behind her and dig a hole. Uh, these guys are not really disturbed by human presence as long as they don't see you. Um, you don't have any lights on, you don't um, touch them at all. Leatherbacks are not quite as sensitive as some of the other turtles. Um, plus they're massive and she had no idea that he was right behind her because he wasn't using any lights, he didn't touch her. Like I said, this is all shot with infrared, so there's not actually light there. Um, but he was able to dig a hole for her. And you can see that she's successfully laying her eggs. So she's kind of one of our feel good stories. You gotta feel bad for her. She just runs with a rough crowd, hangs with the sharks. <laughs> Um, I think we've been able to successfully dig for her maybe 12, 15 times, something like that. She's been around for quite a while. Unfortunately, we haven't seen her in a few years now, but she typically nested a little bit further south than we normally were. So that's Clover and one of her nests that success successfully hatched with our help. Um, this is a just short video of what a healthy nesting turtle looks like. That track right there is typically what we would first see as we're conducting our surveys. Um, it can be anywhere from five to seven feet long. These are massive animals, so it's really hard to miss. It kind of looks like a tractor went up the beach. But they do the same thing as all other species of, do, of sea turtle do. Um, right now, she is what we call body pitting, which is finding a spot on the beach to nest, hanging yourself low in the sand. Then they use, this is a normal rear flipper, so you can see it's usually about two to two and a half feet in length. They dig hole with that with those flippers. Uh, they always leave one hanging in the hole, like you can see there. And then she's laying typically 60 to 80 eggs. So once they've laid 60 to 80 eggs, leatherbacks are unique. If you watch here, you'll see that she lays 
quite a few eggs that are smaller than the first egg she laid. Those are what we call yolkless or spacer eggs. Um, there is no yolk in those eggs. They were not fertilized, they would never develop. They typically lay those at the top of the nest and the purpose of those is not widely understood just yet. But then they're actually very delicate in their covering. They use those beer flippers to kind of pat the sand down over the eggs. Once all is said and done, like I said before, those eggs can be upwards of three feet into the sand. Um, if anybody's ever conducted nesting surveys, trying to excavate or dig up the contents of a hatched leatherback nest is not easy. Um, it's messy and usually you end up face first down in the sand trying to get everything out. <laughs> But unique among leatherbacks are the size of those front flippers. So you can get an idea of what those look like mm -hmm. now. Um, each one of those is you know, upwards of four feet in length. And they tend to make a massive mess on the beach when they're nesting. Um, they will cover for upwards of an hour camouflaging that area. And unless you actually saw the turtle at night, it's quite difficult to find out where those eggs are in the morning. So this we included just as something fun to show you all the unique things that we see out on the beach at night. That was actually a rocket launch from this past season. Uh, we were lucky enough to catch that right at sunrise. Uh, it was one of the prettiest things I've ever seen. But this I wanted to kind of conclude with is just a, some of the fun things you get to experience when you're up all night on the beaches tagging sea turtles for research. Um, so with that, I want to say thank you so much. I know I talk really fast when I talk about turtles just because they excite me. Um, but I also wanted to make sure that I leave plenty of time for questions. Um, for any of us, I know Kelly's still on, so if you have questions about that area or anything that we're doing, I'm going to leave time for that now. So I really appreciate it. Um, you can follow our work on all of our social media accounts or our website, which is floridaleatherbacks.com. If you're interested in the tracking side of things, you can go to trackturtles.com. That has all of our active turtles, as well as some other turtles that we are, hoping, we are hosting for SCCF and the Canadian research group that I mentioned. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. Perfect. Well, thank you. That was awesome. Um, we have a handful of questions. I don't know if we're going to be able to get to all of them. Um, but to start, um, what about the males and where are they and where does mating take place? Oh, if you could answer that, I would love it. Um, now that's one of those things we don't really know a whole lot about. Um, there have been a lot of reported kind of aggregations or mating behavior occurring in central to northern Florida, especially kind of off that Cape Canaveral area. I, don't, I, should, I said a lot, I shouldn't say a lot. A few record, uh, recorded sightings of mating, but we really don't know a whole lot about males. Um, unlike with loggerheads and green turtles, where you can often see the males sticking close to shore here, even during this nesting season, there are rarely reports of male leatherbacks anywhere. So we don't really know much about them at all. Um, some of those research groups that I mentioned, so the group working off the Outer Banks or the group that we work with up in Canada, they have occasionally caught them um, in their in-water work and attempted to put satellite transmitters on some of them. So hopefully, as more and more of those research projects get underway, we'll have a better idea of where they're going. Good question. That's what everybody wants to know. <laughs> so do we. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is the northernmost point for nesting, and why would they choose northern shores over southern shores? So yeah, good question. Northernmost point, like I mentioned before, it's kind of shifting. Um, right now, the densest spot in Florida is Martin County, where we're working, so that's kind of south central. Um, there are nests, I believe that North Carolina had their North first Carolina. nest this year. Um, Georgia occasionally gets a handful, but I believe that North Carolina is the furthest north that any um, leatherback has nested. I don't think Virginia has had any nesting there. Um, but as I mentioned, that there's just kind of a shift. They're slowly starting to nest a little bit further and further north um, in higher numbers. So. I will tell the answer to that one. <laughs> and what kind of hatching success is there? Leatherbacks are usually quite poor. We were actually pretty surprised with the nests that you guys had over um, Sanibel Captiva area. That success was pretty good. Um, typically here we're seeing around maybe 40 to 50 percent, usually closer to the 40 to 45 percent range. Um, and that's kind of a global thing. Uh, leatherback, leatherback hatch success is low um, on a lot of their nesting beaches, whereas like with loggerheads or green turtles, somewhere the, sometimes those are upwards of 70 to 80% of those eggs are hatching. 
Um, so it's kind of a global thing, and there's a lot of work going into why it's so low for them compared to other species, whether it's some kind of contaminant or we don't really know the answer to that, but usually about 40 to 45 percent. And how long do leatherbacks live? And also what triggers the urge that drives them to nest? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic question. So how long do leatherbacks live? Um, that's one of the things that we're trying to answer with studies like this. Uh, there's no way to age a sea turtle. So really the only way is to continue studying the same individuals year after year. Our project is fairly young. Uh, I mentioned we started in 2001. There are some groups that have been tagging for much longer than that. Uh, the longest tag return that I'm aware of for an adult female, there's a big tagging program in Sandy Point, St. Croix in the Caribbean. And they've been tagging for a very long time. And I think they have an individual that's still returning to nest there that they tagged in 1984. Um, so that's a turtle that's been nesting you know, over 30 years. Um, mm -hmm. We don't know the age of maturity for a leatherback, but it's estimated that they start nesting somewhere between maybe eight and 15 years old, which is younger than most um, other species. So lifespan is something that we'd really like to try to address with um, some of the long-term research that we're doing. As far as nesting cues, um, a lot of it is temperature, daylight, things like that. And then within the individual, a lot of it is just hormonal cues. And also related, how long do they carry their eggs before laying? Um, that is an excellent question. So with leatherbacks, actually with all species of sea turtle, um, they can exhibit what's called multiple paternity. So they can nest a single time before the nesting season and that will fertilize all of the nests that they lay for the season. Um, or they can nest with more than one male, and it doesn't have to be before season. They can mate again mid-season, and then they'll have two different fathers or three different fathers or maybe upwards of that um, within a single nest. But the average length of time is roughly two weeks um, between mating and when they can actually produce uh, viable eggs. Do the turtles know, or are they bothered by tagging or skin biopsies or anything related to that? Good question. Um, do you want to answer? I'm just taking over here. You're just sitting here looking pretty. <laughs> I can speak of leatherbacks. Leatherbacks don't seem to care about anything that we do to them. Leatherbacks are big. They, they, they don't care about anything. Yeah, they're, they're very peaceful, mellow animals. <laughs> yeah, we typically try to do all of our research while they're egg laying. All species of sea turtle go into what they call a trance while they're laying their eggs where they're really undisturbed by what's going on around them. They don't seem to feel pain. Um, that could just be part of the labor process, just nature kicking in. Uh, but we try to work in that narrow window when they're actually dropping eggs so that any of the work that we do doesn't really bother them. But I mean, leatherbacks, as Chris mentioned, they're unlike any other species, whereas a loggerhead and a green turtle can be easily deterred and do what's called a false crawl, as Kelly described, um, if they get spooked. The leatherback false crawl rate is less than 10%. So it's very rare that something's going to spook them enough to leave the nesting beach. And then related back to the hatching rate, uh, when you calculate a hatching rate, is that the actual count or is it some other method? So good question. There's actually a lot of variables that go into determining the success of a nest. So the first thing we do is take out the entire contents and set it on the sand. And then we split them up into different categories. So we'll have eggs that didn't hatch. So we call those unhatched. We have eggs that hatch successfully. Um, and then we also have what are called pipped eggs, which is where the hatchling started to get out of the egg and didn't quite make it. They can either be alive or dead. Um, so hatching success, we consider that the number of eggs that successfully hatched from the nest. So. Okay, we just have a few more. All of these are really great questions. Um, they are. <laughs> why is the nesting trend up over time? And is it due to growth in the population? That's a fantastic question. So the graph that I showed you of nesting in Florida um, what did show that exponential increase. One of the thoughts was, like I mentioned, leatherbacks didn't really nest here prior to maybe the 1950s or so. And we've seen that exponential increase ever since. And as I mentioned, we did have that turtle that nested here from Costa Rica. What likely happened in Florida was that there were a few kind of spin-offs or turtles that nested or maybe hatched from a different beach that somehow found their way to Florida and Florida's beaches worked really well for them. So their offspring just continued to um, produce a bigger and bigger population. So what likely happened is they just didn't nest here before. Um, turtles from a different nesting beach made their way here and they are causing that exponential increase. Um, that's one of the questions we kind of tossed around with Juniper that was nesting over there. 
is where did she come from? Um, is she a turtle that hatched from some unknown leatherbacks many years ago, nests in uh, that area many years ago, or did she come from somewhere else? She may have come up from a Caribbean nesting beach, a Central American nesting beach. So we think that's how the East Coast population started. It's from turtles that came from somewhere else. Great, and I think uh, we're about at the end of questions, but uh, this one is either I, either for you guys or Kelly, I don't know which is most appropriate, but uh, what are the reasons why one only one of the seven leatherback nests hatch? And I think that's in reference to Juniper. Kelly, if you're on, I don't know if you want to tackle that one. I can take a stab at it, but I think you have a better idea. <laughs> Sorry, technical difficulties over here. <laughs> no, I think you guys have a better sense of um, general hatch rates and things like that for leatherback nests, but I do know that at least a couple of these nests were underwater for long periods of time during storms this season. Like there was one at Beach Access, one that just sat underwater for almost a full day, and so that probably contributed to the low hatch success in at least some of them. Yeah. Yeah, so if, if it, the question is pertaining specifically to Juniper's nest, yeah, sorry, that's why I asked, but I know we had talked about it, you know, briefly, and a, a lot of it was just storms and uh, waves and things like that, inundation from water. So um, the fact that uh, two of her nests did hatch very well um, is a good sign for her. Unfortunately, it was just a victim of water. I think that the other ones um, didn't make it. Okay, we had one more roll in, and I think we've got time for it. Um, can you tell where they come from by genetics? Yes, excellent question. So that's one of the reasons that we take these genetic samples. Um, the sea turtle community is pretty small. We all kind of work together. Everybody talks to each other. Um, so we have a good network of people that are also collecting genetic samples uh, from turtles on nesting beaches throughout the Atlantic. Um, and we found a lot of close genetics ties to turtles from St. Croix, Trinidad, Caribbean beaches. So as I mentioned, it's likely that that's where they initiated from and then ended up just kind of taking over Florida beaches as well. Great. Um, well, I think that will wrap it up. So um, thanks, great thanks to Kelly and Chris for the really informative and super interesting talk and Kelly for giving us an update on this season. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention before we go, we have another evening in the home, evenings at the homestead uh, coming up in December. It will be Thursday, December 17th at seven o'clock. Dr. Greg Pulakis with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission will be talking about the endangered small tooth sawfish and uh, recovery efforts. So I hope you can join us then. Keep an eye out on our social media and our e-blasts. There'll be information about registration for that soon. So with that, uh, I hope everyone has a good evening, and I want to say thanks again to all of our presenters. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, everybody.